Hello, my name is Alex Herbiter. I'm from Auburn University, Montgomery. Um, now, you've, you've made a lot of good points here, but one of the things you um, said in the beginning, and I'm not going to try and pull you word for word, but generally it was, um, we need to get off of oil, and we need to do it in a way that doesn't hurt businesses and doesn't hurt the consumer and intervenes in the market as little as necessary. Intervening in the market as little as necessary for the common good has been the justification for everything everyone in this room should hate for the last 200 years. Intervening in the market as little as necessary is why we have the uh, ethanol subsidies you are you know, lamenting because it protects our poor, defenseless farmers. Uh, we don't need the government to tell us gas is expensive. We all have cars. There have been, we've seen that as, cars, or as gas has gotten more expensive, Americans have abandoned uh, SUVs. General Motors has every vehicle gets at least 30 miles per gallon, and they've got all these flex fuel vehicles, which wasn't mandated by law. They did it because the market demanded it. You've had people look for Energy Star appliances, and there's a real green revolution, not from the environmentalists, but from middle class Americans who are tired of paying for high energy prices. What's your name? Alex Herber. Alex. Alex, the issue here really is a time issue. It's very simple. Because by choosing to do nothing, choosing to do nothing is essentially, it's also a choice. And choosing to do nothing is a choice to preserve the monopoly of oil in the transportation sector. It's a choice to, to preserve the ability of OPEC to manipulate oil supplies. Now, again, if we were not facing a war with radical Islam, if OPEC countries were, I don't know, in Denmark, Sweden, and Japan, <laughs> then this probably would be different. But the fact is that if you do believe we're at war, this goes back to the question that the, the previous young lady asked. If you do believe we're at war, you have to ask yourself, what are you willing to do about it if you believe that oil is a part of this war? And so I ask you, Alex, what is your proposal? Do you propose to maintain the status quo and do nothing? and just let things take their own time? Or do you propose to do nothing? My belief on economics is that if a monopoly can exist in a market, it serves a market function. Do you think that OPEC serves a market function? If we allow price, or if we allow price to dictate, or to reflect scarcity, then conservation will happen naturally. If people are willing to pay OPEC prices, that's their choice. My dad likes to ride a bike everywhere. I mean, he pedals a bicycle, and I don't, I'm not sarcastic when he say he will go 40 or 50 miles in a day riding his bike. He likes it. He bikes to the store. He bikes to the bank. He doesn't make any trip less than two miles in a car. Uh, you can in encourage public transportation. You can carpool. And there are a variety of ways to avoid buying large amounts of oil. Do you think that if we reduce the amount of oil that we consume, OPEC will not reduce the amount of oil that it produces? If it continues to elevate prices, it's only, it's only going to f hasten its own demise naturally. People will continue to invest in ethanol. I mean, the biggest investors in research and development isn't the federal government, it's British Petroleum and Exxon. This is not an R&D issue, though. You have fuels here that are ready to deploy. You have a chicken and egg problem, essentially. And the question, again, is time. Because what you're talking about could certainly happen. It would take a really long time, and we would all have to drastically constrain our lives. And, and let's just have an illustration here. You probably all live in university towns, but think of your parents or your grandparents. How many of, you, of, your, of your parents or grandparents could get to the grocery store without getting in their car? How many of them could bike to the grocery store and bring back groceries enough for a whole family? How many of them could go to the doctor without getting in their car? How many of them have bus service so they could go to the doctor without getting in their car? Take their kids to school without getting in their car? So we face a very severe problem here. And again, you talk about public transit. Do you think that public transit in areas where people cannot physically walk or bike to a store could be economic? The answer is no. Public transit is not economic if people cannot walk somewhere. The reason is that the density of population is not high enough. So no, public transit would simply not be economic unless oil price really went through the roof. <laughs> through the roof, meaning 140 would be a fond memory. That's how high it would have to go. <laughs> 
for public transit to be somehow perceived as economic and it would probably still need subsidies. Okay, so we do not have other easy options for people to revert to. And again, our options are do nothing, maintain the status quo, maintain OPEC's control, wait for the very slow motion of the invisible hand in this case. And I say very, very slow motion because our options are not great other than what I talked about. Because GM is not going to make 100% of its cars or 90% of its cars flex fuel vehicles unless the fueling infrastructure can catch up. And the fueling infrastructure, the alternative fuel station is not going to install a pump. The investor is not going to invest in it drastically expanding ethanol or methanol capacity unless he has certainty that the rules of the game aren't going to change on him and that he can predict X percent of new cars sold in this country will be flex fuel vehicles and my market is going to, my potential market is going to grow year to year and I go off and decide which feedstock, which process, which fuel I can feed into those cars. So I think we're done, unless y'all have any other questions. That's it? Alrighty, thank you guys. <laughs>